Support has been provided by independent educational grants from Astellas, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs LLC, Merck, Pfizer Incorporated, Sanofi Genzyme, and Eurogen Pharma Incorporated. Hi, this is Vic Nitti, Chair of the AUA Office of Education, welcoming you to another of our Office of Education podcasts. This one, another one in the series of the AUA Expert Exchange podcasts, discussion about managing GU cancer. Today's topic is on the expanding role of immune checkpoint inhibitors in muscle invasive and non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Now, this is an update from a previous podcast that we did about a year ago. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rob Svatek uh, as my co-host. He is a fellowship trained urologic oncologist and the acting chairman for the Department of Urology at UT Health San Antonio. Dr. Svatek's clinical practice is devoted primarily to treating patients with bladder cancer. He also runs an NCI funded laboratory that focuses on understanding immune mechanisms underlying bladder cancer prevention and developing novel immune strategies for treating bladder cancer. Dr. Svatek is an active participant in cooperative group trials and currently serves as the principal investigator for S1602, which is a SWOG trial, which is testing a BCG vaccine and comparing two different BCG strains for treating patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So I can't think of a better person to uh, talk about uh, immune therapy uh, in bladder cancer um, and uh, to really expand on what we spoke about last year. Rob, uh, it's a pleasure to have you back. Thank you for allowing me to, to participate. I, I look forward to this discussion. I do want to uh, make a couple of disclosures uh, as these are related to my talk. Uh, I am a consultant for FKD therapies as well as Faring Pharmaceuticals, which have some relevance to, to what I'll be talking about today. Thank you, Dr. Nitti, for the opportunity. Thanks, Rob. I'm going to go over our learning objectives and then we'll get right into our discussion. So there are three learning objectives um, for this podcast. The first is to recognize disease states for which immunotherapy is indicated in the treatment of both non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive bladder cancer. Number two is to understand the tumor mutation burden and why response to immunotherapy is associated with TMB, tumor mutation burden. And finally, to recognize strengths and limitations of current evidence for checkpoint inhibitors in non-metastatic in non bladder cancer. So with that in mind, we'll head into our discussion and uh, Rob, I'd like to start by just saying at our last discussion, you outlined the role of immunotherapy and specifically checkpoint inhibitors for the treatment of bladder cancer. At that time, those agents were largely used in patients with metastatic disease. But since then, uh, I was wondering if there has been uh, more, a more use of checkpoint inhibitors um, in less advanced disease states. Yeah, so... <clears throat> There has been some advances made and we will go, I'd like to talk about both uh, uh, for patients that have muscle invasive as well as non-muscle invasive. Uh, just to start with the review, uh, platinum-based chemotherapy is the first line for metastatic bladder cancer and overall response rates for patients with metastatic disease for cisplatin-based chemotherapy is about 45%, which is actually really good. Uh, the problem is that the response is short-lived now, during my residency and fellowship training uh, just about 10 years ago, there were no good options for patients who had failed cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Uh, however, in 2016, a marked revolution uh, for, the, for treating metastatic bladder cancer occurred with the FDA approval of several checkpoint inhibitors for this disease. And checkpoint inhibitors um, include target program cell death protein 1, commonly abbreviated as PD-1, or its ligand. And, and the, the uh, therapy uh, 
our antibodies against these uh, proteins. Importantly, five of these agents are approved by the FDA for treating urothelial cell carcinoma, including drugs we'll talk about today, atezolizumab, avelumab, durvalumab, uh, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab. Uh, and Dr. Nettie, since we, since we last spoke, there have been some important developments. First, a new role for checkpoint inhibitors has been established called a switch maintenance therapy. And this is um, now standard of care based on data from a phase three Javelin Bladder 100 trial that, that uh, took patients with metastatic bladder cancer who did not progress after they, they were given first line platinum based chemotherapy. So these were either stable disease or partial responses, but they did not progress and they were randomly assigned to Avelumab or best supportive care. And the, the group that got Avelumab experienced a significant benefit in overall survival, 21 months versus 14 months, roughly. Um, and that established switch therapy as the new standard of care in this particular disease site. And as we'll talk about in a bit, there have been some new developments in non-metastatic muscle invasive and non-metastatic non-muscle invasive bladder cancer as well, including new studies that show efficacy for patients undergoing cystectomy and for patients with BCG unresponsive bladder cancer. So it sounds like considerable progress has been made in bladder cancer with the use of checkpoint inhibitors. What about other GU tumors? Uh, have we seen similar progress in renal, prostate, testis cancers? So immune therapy has been around, uh, for, as, you, as you know, um, for a long time with kidney cancer. Uh, one of the earliest forms of treatment was interleukin-2, which was uh, uh, approved, approved for renal cell carcinoma. The checkpoint inhibitors have shown activity in renal cell, not so much in prostate, and not really studied in testis cancer. Uh, notably, the anti-PD-1 antibody nivolumab was tested in the, checkpoint, the Checkmate 25 trial. This is for second line metastatic renal cell carcinoma, uh, showing a, a significant benefit in overall survival, about 27, 30% compared to Everolimus. And that prompted its approval by the FDA for that second line setting. Also, it's important for urologists to know that nivolumab in combination with another checkpoint inhibitor, ipilimumab, commonly referred to as the nevo ipi combination, is approved for first-line setting in patients with intermediate or poor-risk renal cell carcinoma. And then finally, and more recently, FDA has approved uh, combinations of Pembro and Avelumab with Exitinib, a, uh, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, for the treatment of uh, kidney cancer as a first line in the metastatic setting. So there's been significant progress in renal cell with these checkpoint inhibitors. In prostate, they have not, they have not uh, done so well. There are a subset of prostate cancer patients who seem to benefit. And it, it's some really interesting data showing that patients that have a DNA mismatch repair deficiency that develop microsatellite instability may be the best uh, uh, tumors that might respond to this. Uh, and this supports work, a working hypothesis around checkpoint inhibitors for targeting uh, tumors with lots of mutations, which we'll talk about later. Um, but right now, run-of-the-mill prostate cancer has not, uh, is not being, uh, checkpoint inhibitors are not being used. So let's talk a little bit about the, the current understanding of checkpoint inhibitors mechanism of action. In our last discussion, you detailed the history and development of cancer immunotherapy and checkpoint inhibitors. I was wondering if you could provide any updates regarding the biology of these agents from a, a mechanistic standpoint. So the <clears throat> classic understanding is that PD-1 on the surface of T cells uh, binds to its ligand PD-L1 present on the tumors. And that interaction elicits a suppressive response to the T cells. And so the idea is that tumors can suppress T cells from uh, 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 having cytotoxicity and from annihilating the tumors through that engagement. And the antibodies would interrupt that, that uh, ligation or that interaction, allowing the T cell to then target the tumor. 
But there are some problems with that kind of working hypothesis. And number one is, well, why don't some tumors that express PDL1 respond to these drugs? Uh, and conversely, why do, pay, why do uh, other tumors that don't express PDL1 respond? So there is more to the picture than that simple paradigm. The, so along some of the lines are what other things might influence response. Um, presence of T cells in the tumor. So actually looking at particularly CD8 T cells, which tend to be the more effector kind that are eliciting the killing, the, the presence of those T cells in the tumor appear to be associated with a, a good response. And so we do think that there are other factors that may be driving uh, the, the, the T cell responses besides just the PD-1 and PD-L1 engagement between those two cells. For example, uh, macrophages also express these molecules and, and effects of the drugs on uh, other immune cells besides T cells, including macrophages and myeloid derived suppressor cells may be important. Another, another cell type is a regulatory T cell, also called Tregs. These cells are essential for maintaining self tolerance. And these cells are marked by the expression of a transcription factor called FOXP3. These cells, regulatory T cells, uh, suppress CD8 T cell function through different mechanisms like secreting cytokines and chemokines. And there's evidence that checkpoint inhibitors, particularly anti-CTLA-4, works in part through its depletion of Tregs. Um, uh, B cells, which make antibodies, also have regulatory phenotypes. And there's some really interesting data that B regs or regulatory B cells can control CD8 T cell behavior and then are modulated by checkpoint inhibitors. So I think what we're going to be seeing uh, over the next several years is um, other molecules like macrophages, B cells, regulatory T cells, myeloid derived suppressor cells being important in the mechanism of checkpoint inhibitors and potentially being used in determining whether or not a patient should be getting a checkpoint inhibitor. I want to talk just for a moment about a scientist that I work closely with named Dr. Tyler Curiel in San Antonio. He's a cancer immunologist at, at our institution, and he's identified some really novel effects of PDL1 on the tumor inside the tumor itself, what we call tumor cell intrinsic effects of PDL1 signaling. So this is, for example, the PDL1 regulating tumor growth independent of the immune system and regulating uh, mTOR signaling, regulating autophagy through PDL1 itself. And what he showed is that by silencing PDL1 in the tumor, you can affect response to other agents and you can affect the uh, development of the tumor and tumorigenesis. So these are kind of things that I'm really excited about, I think have uh, an important role in the future. So Rob, I was wondering if you could help our listeners understand why these basic mechanisms are so clinically important. So understanding these mechanisms of action of these drugs will do two things. First, it will help us to identify biomarkers that can be used by clinicians to help guide our treatment, to identify patients that are more or less likely to respond. In the last section of today's talk, I will elaborate more on this and talk about a real world example that's currently being used uh, to, to regulate treatment selection. Secondly, it will help us identify novel combination approaches that will be used with checkpoint inhibitors to improve their effectiveness. For example, Dr. Curiel's group that I mentioned, uh, they showed that tumor cell intrinsic PDL1 is altering the sensitivity to other treatment agents, such as interferon gamma and mTOR inhibitors like rapamycin. So this mechanism that he identified can be used to exploit the activity of checkpoint inhibitors. For example, combining rapamycin with a checkpoint inhibitor in certain types of, of tumors that express uh, a cellular PDL1. That's, that's an example of how we might use that to guide combination therapy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy for cystectomy. Uh, there have been 
some recent uh, remarkable studies published on the effect of giving checkpoint inhibitors prior to cystectomy. Can you elaborate on these trials a little bit? Yes, the, the current standard of care for non-metastatic muscle invasive bladder cancer is either um, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a cisplatin-based regimen followed by radical cystectomy, or in some cases, chemo radiation. However, although uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the standard of care, many patients are not eligible for cisplatin due to impaired renal function or poor performance status. And in addition, some patients with clinically localized, say, T2, N0 disease may not derive benefit from neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And we all know that neoadjuvant chemotherapy carries a significant potential for side effects. Checkpoint inhibitors have less side effects, generally speaking, than, than neoadjuvant or chemotherapy. And if they, they have recently been explored in neoadjuvant setting, single agent checkpoint inhibitor trials include the PURE-1 pembrolizumab trial and the Abacus atezolizumab trial, both of which showed some pretty provocative findings. The complete response rate, meaning no tumor identified at the time of cystectomy in patients that were given one of these agents was 37% for pembrolizumab and 31% for atezolizumab. It's pretty remarkable. And, and the other thing is if you look at downstaging, so not just including the patients with no tumor, but looking at patients that had, say, a non-muscle invasive TA tumor, the response rate is even higher. So it's an exciting data. The, there's other trials that I need to mention. Um, the HOG trial, uh, which was a combination of Gymsys plus pembrolizumab, and there's the BLAST trial, which was Gymsys plus nivolumab. Those also, those also showed pathologic complete response rates uh, on the order of 30, uh, let's see, 44% for the HOG trial and 34% for the BLAST trial. So it's got the, th this is, these are pretty remarkable findings and we're all excited about the potential of, of incorporating these into the perioperative setting. How does that affect um, your surgery? Um, does it increase morbidity? Uh, are there any special things that need to be done uh, just prior to or at the time or in the post-op period? Um, you know, it, does it, it, is safety compromised in any way with neoadjuvant immune therapy? So from what we, from the data that we have now, it appears that these agents are more, are uh, safer than neoadjuvant chemotherapy and can be given right up until the time of surgery. Um, we've, We've dealt with um, some significant toxicities from neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, including renal dysfunction, um, peripheral neuropathy, um, it, things like of that nature. And so generally speaking, these patients, the safety profile of these agents certainly favors the safety profile over neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And the, and the discontinuation rate for immunotherapy is, very, is, is, is pretty low. Now, one of the downsides uh, that we have to mention is that these trials were, number one, they were not done with a comparative group. So these were phase two single arm um, uh, trials. And it's, it's difficult and it will be important for us to know how these will perform in the long term and with a proper control group. Um, will there be an effect on overall survival? Will there be an effect on progression free survival? We, we need to figure that out before these are approved. Also, these agents are very expensive and we need comparative effectiveness assessments, uh, including consideration of the cost of the side effects, the cost of the agent, the, the quality adjusted life year metrics to determine how these, these agents will compare to uh, standard therapy or other options. Do you think that there's a chance with proper, with the proper studies that neoadjuvant immune therapy could replace neoadjuvant chemotherapy? I think that would be, it might replace it for some patients. 
um, maybe the lower risk uh, clinical T2, N0. It's hard for me to imagine that it will completely replace it, especially for those higher risk patients. Well, let's talk a little bit about the adjuvant setting. Uh, can we give checkpoint inhibitors after cystectomy instead of beforehand? And for what reasons? So, so uh, Dr. Nettie, it, it makes a great, <clears throat> great deal of sense to consider this population because um, we know that despite the benefit of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, a significant number of patients either don't receive neoadjuvant chemo or they have very advanced disease such that we see persistent tumor or nodal disease even after they've received chemotherapy. And we know those patients are at very high risk for disease relapse. Also, with the, the powerful effect that, uh, of switch therapy that I spoke about earlier, um, it would suggest that immunotherapy after chemotherapy may help improve survival in this lower disease setting. So what has the data shown so far? Well, there was a large trial, an adjuvant trial called Invigor 010 that was recently reported at ASCO uh, in August, actually, by Dr. Petros Grievous. The trial randomized patients to atezolizumab or observation in the adjuvant setting. About a, about a half of the patients had had prior neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and some of these were upper tract disease. Maybe six to seven percent were upper tract, and the remaining were bladder cancer patients. Um, unfortunately, the, the study did not show a benefit for the patients receiving atezolizumab. No significant difference was observed for the two groups. We are eagerly awaiting the results of the ambassador trial that's led by Dr. Apollo, and that's testing pembrolizumab versus observation in the adjuvant setting using a similar trial to that of the Invigor trial. So right now, bottom line is we don't know of the value of adjuvant immunotherapy, um, and we are anxiously awaiting more data. Well, I know a lot has been said recently about the expansion of Immune, immunotherapy for patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So I was wondering if we could start uh, by first reviewing some of the current challenges and clinical unmet, clinical unmet needs for patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Right. So <clears throat> for, for non-muscle invasive uh, and non-metastatic uh, bladder cancer, these are different challenges than the more advanced disease. And in this disease setting, what we're afraid of happening is progression. We're afraid of these progressing to a muscle invasive state. We're also sensitive to the considerable burden uh, that we put on the patients to have repeated installations of intravesical BCG, uh, as well as the um, financial toxicity and the fear of recurrence that these patients suffer. So our goals here are a little different. Our goals are to prevent, really, prevent the disease from progressing. And so for patients that have failed BCG or are unresponsive, the, the, the standard of care is radical cystectomy. And that's evolving, that's changing. There are FDA approved agents for treating BCG unresponsive disease. Valrubicin is approved for BC patients with BCG unresponsive carcinoma in situ, but its response rate of about, let's say 20% based on, on phase two evidence and a lack of long-term durability uh, really thwarted the enthusiasm to use it. It's still being used in very isolated or small sections, but generally speaking, it's, 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 <clears throat> it's not at, as effective as we'd like to see. Um, there is an expansion of immunotherapy in this site. In January of this year, the FDA approved pembrolizumab for non-muscle invasive, high-risk, BCGN-responsive bladder cancer based on a phase two trial uh, that was done globally, showing a response rate of about 40% with a median duration of 16 months and about 46% of the patients experiencing a complete response lasting uh, about 12, uh, 12 months. So that's pretty good. Uh, about half of them are, are having a complete response up to a year. Important caveats to that study are that um, there was no control group. And we know that some patients are probably treated effectively with a good TUR and fulguration. In addition, the benefit 
uh, of that drug was largely observed by patients outside the United States. It's hard to know if this would be generalizable to our treatment uh, in our patients here. So we also await validation of these findings. Um, I, I wanna talk also about another trial that's likely to get approved here soon, and that's uh, uh, the drug Instiladrin. This is an adenovirus-based gene therapy that when given intravesically, induces the urothelial cells to express interferon alpha 2b. And that interferon alpha 2b is a potent anti-tumor cytokine. Uh, the results of the phase three trial, also non-comparative single arm trial, were presented by Colin Denny, uh, who led the development of that agent. And that drug in phase three studies showed a complete response rate of 54% in patients with CIS. And the complete response was maintained uh, in 24% of the patients at a year. So this was conducted only in the US and is a first of its kind type of therapy for gene therapy. Um, and so we do anticipate that this may uh, be approved in the near future. Rob, do you think that there's a role for any of these agents in lower risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? So this is uh, interesting because the, the companies are now moving into the lower risk. And by lower risk, we're, we're talking about people that have not had any BCG before. Um, there are, there's another risk, uh, group of patients that have had some BCG, but they're not quite BCG responsive. And there are active trials in these uh, settings. Um, <clears throat> I am concerned about using these agents in those settings. Uh, and I'm one of the maybe a uh, few that, that have spoken out against it. I'm, my concern is that although the side effect profile of these agents is low, extremely low, it's not zero. And we have seen fatalities from uh, serious adverse events from immune related therapy. And so imagine taking a patient who has not seen any BCG and putting them on a systemic therapy that has a fatality risk above zero. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be, I think, a difficult uh, situation, especially if, if uh, we have other agents out there like BCG that have pretty good, pretty good response rates initially. So I think the patients who are likely to benefit from that are a very small number, and it'll take a long time for us to kind of tease out who would be best to start on a systemic therapy. Um, so I, I, I do think that if you've, you've had some BCG, um, then there certainly is a role for looking at that, those drugs in that setting. All right. The last thing I wanted, uh, wanted you to touch upon a little bit are, are, uh, are novel biomarkers. And are, are there any biomarkers that could be used to distinguish responders from non-responders? And are any of these available? Right. So the first most important biomarker that was uh, examined and is still being used today is pdl one expression. And, and as to what we talked about earlier, pdl one expression on the tumor is one of the classic kind of paradigms by which these agents are thought to be working. And it is true that pdl one expression does influence uh, the, the response rate of these agents. That said, the limitations are that it's not perfect. There are plenty of patients that don't express PDL1 that might respond. There are other patients that do express PDL1 that don't respond. Also, there's different types of antibodies to PDL1, different manufacturers, different cut points. So that, that does limit um, the overall use of this. There are new biomarkers emerging, and I wanna talk about a recent example, example of one that was actually approved this summer by the FDA, uh, received accelerated approval of pembrolizumab, which is also called Keytruda, for second line treatment of any metastatic tumor or unrespectable uh, tumor if, you, if the tumor has a high tumor mutation burden or TMB. And then this is remarkable, think about this. This is any tumor, any cancer that has a high TMB you, in the second line settings, they, they failed some first line, this is now approved. That's a, that's a remarkable designation. Um, and so what is TMB? What are we talking about here? So uh, 
tumors, cancer generally has mutations, right? These are genetic mutations that have, occur have occurred through either a genetic predisposition or some environmental exposure. And some tumors have more genetic insults than others, especially tumors that develop from carcinogens like bladder cancer. They tend to have a lot of different mutations as opposed to a BRCA mutation that develops from a her heritable defect. So, and that's also why bladder cancer and other carcinogen induced tumors we think respond better. It's because they have a lot of different mutations in the genome, which means they have a lot of new antigens that can be presented to uh, a T cell. And so the more new antigens or, or, or new mutations that you have, the, the number of T cells that can kill that tumor are increased. And that's why these uh, agents tend to work better in tumors that have a high uh, mutation burden. And so the specific indication is if you have a tumor that has 10 or more mutations per megabase of DNA, and if you have that, you failed first-line therapy, then pembrolizumab is currently approved. The response rates, by the way, that was, that, that was a trial based on 800 patients, of which 100 had a high tumor mutation burden. And these are very advanced tumors. Um, the response rate was uh, 29%, so roughly a third. And half of those patients had responses lasting two years. So I think this is an incredible amount of progress. Um, and I think this is something that we're going to be using uh, for our patients is monitoring their TMB uh, through, through different, there's different ways that you can do that, uh, but that would become standard, standard of practice for advanced cases. Well, Rob, that was a wonderful update uh, on what has happened uh, in the past year from when we did uh, this similar podcast. Um, I, I just would like you to make some closing remarks to sort of uh, hit on, uh, on some of the high points of, uh, of what has changed in the last year. Thank you, Dr. Nitti. So I think the high points would be the advances that we're seeing in the, that we saw in the metastatic setting are now being uh, translated closer to uh, less advanced disease and closer to our, our uh, workspace. So this is important for urologists. We've seen some more understanding of the mechanisms of how these act, drugs work, which influences biomarker discovery, like tumor, tumor mutation burden, as well as combination therapy. These are predict, predict, <clears throat> principally working in bladder, but they're also working in kidney. And it's, it's likely that they'll be working in subsets of patients with other tumors like prostate cancer. Um, the immune therapy is not new to urologists. Uh, urologic surgeons and their patients have been suffering from uh, bladder and kidney cancer, especially, uh, especially bladder, and, bladder and kidney cancer have benefited most from immunotherapy like BCG and IL-2 that we talked about. And these were among the weapons in our arsenal decades, uh, decades ago when immunotherapy was, was being criticized. Um, since 2016, we have witnessed a resurgence of interest in cancer immunotherapy and a revolution in how we manage more advanced patients. I, I personally will never forget the first time a patient of mine who I, I witnessed benefit from a checkpoint inhibitor. It was a cystectomy patient who during follow-up had developed a thoracic spinal mets and uh, multiple retroperitoneal lymph nodes, all of which vanished after six months of checkpoint inhibitor. And I, I was so dumbfounded by the imaging that I thought I was looking at the wrong films. So I feel very fortunate to be a urologist and to have lived through a, such a dramatic improvement in medicine. Uh, you know, I chose to, to take care of bladder cancer patients in residency because at that time there were few options, and now there are many. I think it's important for us as urologists to join our colleagues in medical oncology and radiation oncology in developing, participating in these trials, and also to join the scientists in the lab and the bench side to making fundamental discoveries. Our intimate contact with patients, both in and out of the operating room, provides us with a perspective that others don't have, and it facilitates us uh, to be leaders, co-leaders, I would say, not spectators in the, the pursuit of making uh, lives better for our patients. Thank you to Dr. Nitti and the AUA for their appreciation of these concepts as they relate to our field and for the opportunity to participate in this podcast. Thank you.
Dr. Rob Svatek, Acting Chairman for the Department of Urology at UT Health in San Antonio. Uh, thank you for that really uh, uh, excellent update on the expanding role of immune checkpoint inhibitors in the treatment of muscle invasive and non-muscle invasive bladder cancer.